This morning, speak a word of welcome to everyone. It's great to see you here. Today is the Lord's Day. It is the best day of the week that New Testament Christians gather together to worship and praise the Lord, be able to gather together and sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, pray together, study His Word together, and on Lord's Day, able to commune together as well as lay by in store. It's indeed an honor, a distinct privilege that we as New Testament Christians have. We have an awesome crowd today. Even though we have a few of our members that are out and traveling in a variety of places, I know Brother Cliff is preaching in the Lexington congregation today, and others out of town and work, but they go to congregation in the area where they are, and we just want everyone to know that we're very blessed today to have you here. We appreciate the prayers that have been led this morning. And we especially appreciate the fact they mentioned Brother Terry George, who's preparing for his surgery on Tuesday. And we will call upon you to say within your private prayers and your family prayers, as well as our congregation of prayers, that prayers will go up in an abundance on his behalf as he goes through this surgery. Now I want us all to be there willing, ready, and able to help in every way we possibly can to help bear one another's burden during this difficult time. As you see on the board today, we want to address a topic simply entitled, Christians Take Courage. Of all the words we try to do as an evangelist and as a local elder, we do the things we can to encourage one another. But we also encourage, but we draw encouragement from men and women, brothers and sisters, who really put the Lord first. It is no doubt within my mind that many times as mentioned in Scripture, the Lord knew exactly what He had in mind. He wants us to encourage one another. But along with encouragement, come with courage to make the right decisions at the right time. Courage it's something we need to say no when those we happen to be around may say yes to something they should say no about. Courage is something that we as Christians need to have to be able to stand alone when no one else is around who is the New Testament Christian making the right choices. We need to be willing to stand alone. And it takes courage to do that. It is so easy to go along with the crowd. It is so easy to try to get lost in the crowd. But we as Christians, we're taught by the Lord Jesus in Matthew 5, 13 through 16, to let our light so shine for others that they will see our good works, but glorify God on this behalf. Any good deed we do, when we let our light so shine, when we do other things similar, we are bringing glory to God. And that's what our life as New Testament Christians is all about. Bringing glory to God the Father. This morning we want to talk about Christians take courage. And our major focus will be the Apostle Paul. I heard one preacher say one time that the Apostle Paul has very likely been quoted in more pulpits than Jesus Christ himself. Well, at first, it took me back. I wasn't sure he was accurate in that statement. But then the longer I thought about it, trying to be open-minded and listen and think about what he said, he might be right. You know, Paul did write 14 of the 27 books of the New Testament, <clears throat> giving credit to Paul for writing Hebrews. Jesus' writings about his birth and his life and his death and his resurrection and his ascension were recorded in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And scattered out through the remainder of the Bible are a few quotations of what Jesus said. In the book of Revelation, chapter 22, Jesus said, I, Jesus, referred to the end of the world and the end of time. So as far as that goes, that might be accurate. But whether it is or whether it's not, two great men in the Bible, among others, have had a tremendous impact on Christian people. Number one, 
head above all the rest, is Jesus. Jesus, who is tempted in all points like we are, yet without sin, Hebrew 4 and verse 15. Second, the Apostle Paul, who is identified in Scripture as one who is born out of due season. He was not one of the original 12 apostles, but he came on a little later, and we're going to introduce him to you today. The very beginning we know about the man who later became the Apostle Paul, who earlier was known as Saul of Tarsus. And then we're going to show a tremendous difference in his life, a different focus, a different place to put his energy and all of his efforts. And by so doing, I hope that we can learn and really grow and be encouraged and become more courageous in saying no when we should say no. Say yes when we should say yes. And when we don't know, we say, I don't know, therefore I won't do it. I'm not going to do anything that I don't absolutely know is right. Whatsoever is not a faith is sin, according to Romans 14. So we want to make sure to draw this courage for the New Testament men and women. And today in our lesson, we'll focus in on the great Apostle Paul. To my right, we see three passages of Scripture. Acts the 7th chapter and verse 58. Acts the 8th chapter, verse 3. Acts 9, verses 1 through verse 6. Now these are the first three times we have Saul of Tarsus introduced in the New Testament. In Acts 7, verse 58, Saul was there where there was stoning Stephen to death. And in verse 58 he said that the people laid down their clothes and their coat at a young man's feet whose name was Saul. Acts 7, 58 is the first time Saul who later becomes the Apostle Paul, is mentioned in New Testament Scripture. They laid down their coats at a young man's feet whose name was Saul, while they stoned Stephen to death, one of the seven chosen in Acts the sixth chapter, to do a great work to help the widows who have been neglected in Acts the sixth chapter. But yet he lived a shorter life because he was stoned to death. The story of Stephen is a magnificent story that gives us encouragement. It was Stephen, you remember, who as he was dying, and as they were stoning him to death, he looked up and he saw Jesus standing at the right hand of God. That had to be an encouraging moment. It had to be a moment that Jesus was wanting him, hang in there, stay the course, do not falter under the weight of pressure. You stay the course. No doubt, Stephen did. Saul of Tarsus gave his voice against Stephen. In the book of Acts, the 8th chapter, verse 3, to the next chapter, the Word of God teaches that Saul made havoc of the church. Saul did everything he could to persecute New Testament Christians. He was determined to take them out like Stephen was taken out by death. Saul made havoc destruction, difficulty for the church. Acts the ninth chapter 1 through 6, we find where Saul went and he got written permission that he could go to Damascus approximately 150 miles away and put men and women bound and bring them back. This would not have been a pleasant journey either way. But especially if you're the man or a woman who were bound and brought back. My dear friends, this didn't happen. On the way to Damascus, right outside of the city, Saul of Tarsus, he learned he needed to go to Damascus. But when he got there, he wasn't there to do what he initially planned to do. No, he was there, and he was now had seen this great light from heaven. And this life said, you go ahead and go to Damascus. There, it will be told you what you must do. And now we begin to see a transformation in him. A transition from being the chief of sinners that Paul or Saul referred to himself in 1 Timothy 1 
And verse 12, I'm chiefest of sinners to becoming one of the greatest men this side of Jesus Christ and him crucified. So what we learn from Acts 7, what we learn from Acts 8, what we learn from Acts 9, that Saul of Tarsus detested, even hated the cause for which Jesus came to present. He did everything in his power. Now you may say, what a wicked ter- person that was. He was doing what he was taught to do. He was trained under Dr. Gamaliel, who was the doctor of the law. Saul of Tarsus did exactly what he was trained to do, but he was trained wrong. What do we learn from that today? We can be taught wrong. That is the reason the Word of God said in Acts 17, verse 11, that we as Christians should always search the Scriptures daily to see whether these things are so. Whether I am your speaker, one of the other elders, one of the deacons, one of the teachers of the congregation, or anyone else. Anytime anyone stands at this pulpit and proclaims to you a message, you search the scriptures daily to make sure it is true. That is your responsibility. And you will find that to be very, very rewarding. But yet what is interesting this man, at the time of his life, in Acts 7, 8, and 9, he became a totally different individual with a different focus. We find in Philippians 4, verse 11, if you notice here, and then Philippians 4, verse 13, and then 2 Timothy 1 and 12, a man who took on a new attitude, a better attitude, a man who took on the challenges that came his way, a man that was content, and taking all the challenges, he let it be made known with no uncertain turn. He said, I have learned in whatsoever state I'm in, therewith I will be content. That's a tall saying. That's a difficult thing to say. It's a difficult thing to do. Whatever situation I'm in, I will be content. And do you know what? You find Saul at other time who now became the Apostle Paul, like in Acts 16, Paul and Silas were in prison. Instead of moaning and groaning, complaining about it, you know what he did? He sang psalms. He was singing spiritual songs that were so very encouraging. And great things happened that day. We'll talk about it another time, as we've talked about it in times gone by. But then go down two verses, please. Philippians 4, verse 13. This is a favorite passage of a lot of people. Paul said, I can do all things through Christ which strengthened me. Here's the same man that was there and gave his voice against Stephen to put him to death, made havoc of the church, got written permission to go to Damascus, put men and women in prison, and now the same man is that calling these words Whatever state I'm in, I'll be content. He will echo these words. I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me. Now look at 2 Timothy 1 and 12. Paul said, I know who I believed in. I am persuaded he's able to keep me and be committed to the judgment of that great day. What a great and a fascinating event. Saul was encouraged to press on. We should draw encouragement. Paul was a great man that is a man who took Christian who took courage. That's what we've got to do. You've got to be prepared to go through whatever it takes. There may be people to laugh at you. They may make fun of you. But there may come a time in our lifetime, like in other countries, that Christians are being persecuted. We have been blessed for many, many years. I'm 57 years old. I've been very blessed. I've never suffered a physical persecution. Oh, people laugh at you when they say, hey, let's go do this on Sunday or Wednesday. You say, oh, no, we attend worship on those days. And they may put their finger in your face or they may put their finger in your chest and they may laugh at you, make fun of you. My dear friend, you stand up. You stand up for Jesus, as you often see. You stand up for what's right. You take courage and do the right thing. Well, what we learn from Paul's life, he gives four verses. 1 Corinthians 4, 
and verse 16. 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 1. Also, 1 Thessalonians 1 and verse 6. 2 Thessalonians 3, 7 through 9. And a relationship of these four verses, Paul the Apostle is saying, follow me. Follow me as I follow Jesus. In the particular passage in 4 and 16 of 1 Corinthians, he said, follow me. In 1 Corinthians 11 verse 1, he laid forth the important attribute. He said, I want you to be followers of me, even as I also as I am of Christ. I want you to follow me. You follow me because if you're following me, I'm following Jesus. You'll be following Jesus. How many of us today to make such a statement? How many of us are courageous enough to say, you follow me and I follow Jesus? I would hope that all of you baptized believers, Scripture is baptized according to the baptism of the Great Commission. I would hope that every one of you men and every one of you women, including myself, that we can tell anybody, you follow me as I follow Christ. It's not an egotistical thing. It's just simply a way to help others walk down that straight, that narrow pathway. In the Thessalonians letter, he teaches the same thing. Follow me. Follow me. Follow me. Follow me. Dear friends, today, the message we can learn, live a life that if somebody is following you, you would lead them to heaven. You know, Saul of Tarsus who became the Apostle Paul, he had a lot of challenges and difficulties. It's quite amazing. I want to hit a few of these very briefly, but I want to mention them to you. Many of these, you know the whole story. And if you don't know, write down these passages and you can learn them. It's very, very good. I will not be taking time to go into them in detail. But when Paul was in Damascus, if you would turn to Acts 9, the first three points we mentioned is all taken from Acts 9. So let's look together at Acts 9 chapter, <coughs> and we'll see a few things. Here is Paul in some difficult times he faced. Now remember, in Acts 9, 1 through 6, you see the transition from being a, a sinner to being a saint. Saul became a New Testament Christian. And therefore, Acts 9, 23 through 25, we're going to learn how was he received. Here's how he was received. The Bible said, after many days were fulfilled, the Jews, they took counsel to kill him. He was a new Christian. The Jews were trying to find a reason to kill Paul. In verse 24, but their land in, a wait, land in wait was known of Saul, and they watched the gates day and night. Why? To kill him. That would be a very good reason to throw in the towels that I quit. But they were barking up their own tree. This man was not about to throw in the towel. He wasn't about to quit. Look at the next verse. Then the disciples, they took him by night. They let him down the wall in a basket so he could head to Jerusalem. You know what I learned here? The trip down the wall in the basket tells you exactly how he was received. That was quite a trip because those walls were not four foot tall. That was quite a trip. He took a walk, trip down a wall in the basket by a fellow Christian helping him to escape because they were lying in wait to kill him. And then you look at verses 26 to 31. He left Damascus, went down to Jerusalem. When he got down there, guess what? Even the Christians were afraid of him. We find the Jews who opposed Christianity, they were afraid of him. They wanted to take him out and kill him. But in Jerusalem, even the Christians were afraid of him. Barnabas said, wait a minute, wait a minute. He's a good man. He's a baptized believer. He's changed his way. He's spoken in defense of Jesus now. He has turned to 180. They're still afraid of him. So eventually... They, the saints, the Christians, they said, you need to go ahead and go down to Tarsus. That way, we can have rest around here. It's pretty turbulent here in Jerusalem with you being here. Your very presence being here. Unfortunately, you've got to go. You've got to go to, to Tarsus. So therefore, he heads down to Tarsus. 
Acts the ninth chapter. You might want to look at that passage in verse 30. With which when the brethren knew it, they brought him down to Caesarea, sent him forth to Tarsus. This shows you may not have the grand and the glory of fireworks when you're baptized, you dedicate your life to the Lord, you obey the gospel, you rededicate your life. You may think there will be some great big things happening and a total smooth over your life, but guess what? You can think wrong. It doesn't automatically mean you can face trial of the persecution, but it doesn't automatically mean everything's going to be rosy. You've got to have the courage to stand up for what's right regardless of what happens to you. Paul and Barnabas in Acts 15. This is 36 through 41. I want to paraphrase this. Paul and Barnabas were great men of God, great contenders for the faith. They traveled together all the way up to this point. It was Barnabas and it was Paul. After Acts 15, it was Paul and whoever traveled with him. Because Acts 15, there was a difficult moment happened. They got ready for their second missionary journey. They'd already taken the first one, and they took a young man, John Mark, with them. For whatever reason, John Mark decided, I want to go home. Or I want to go elsewhere. And he left. Well, that was not impressive, Paul. So when time comes for the second trip, Barnabas said, let's call John Mark and take him with him. Paul said, nope. Barnabas said, I want to take John Mark. And Paul said, I'm not. But here they go. Butted heads. Two great spiritual leaders butted heads. You can look at it. You can read it yourself. The Bible said in verse 39, the contention was so sharp between them, Barnabas, he took Mark. He didn't budge a bit. He dug his heels in. He took Mark and he went his way. Paul, he chose Silas. Why did he choose Silas? Acts 15 and 39, because he was recommended by the brethren. So Paul took Silas and went his way. Barnabas took John Mark and went his way. If that would happen today, you very likely could have had a Paul camp and a Barnabas camp. And that would be wrong. They both are doing the will of the Lord. They had a different judgment about what was best, what wasn't. We should not be arguing about things like that. They both are doing a great, great work. So don't push it to the point of causing a division. They didn't. They just went their way into their own work. But you know what we find here in Acts 15? <clears throat> John Mark, who at that moment was not a great person that Paul relied on, but before he died in 2 Timothy 4, on his deathbed, if you would, he could see where his head could be removed from his body in just a few short hours or days. You know who he asked for? John Mark. Paul asked for John Mark to come to him because he's profitable to me for the ministry. That shows that he didn't harbor our Hard will, ugly will. No, he didn't harbor ill will at all. He just simply at that moment didn't think it was best. I want you to know sometimes you can differ on a matter of judgment and it's all right. We can't differ on worship, doctrine, salvation. No, sir, we cannot. But you can differ on matters of judgment like they did. Okay. Physical abuse. Oh, this is sad. I can't spend the whole time. 2 Corinthians 11, 23-28. I'm not going to even read it all. But he tells you how many times he was beaten with whips and rods and difficulty. That is so sad. But then he said, even after all the physical abuse, I had upon me the care of all the churches. Wow. I know. The longer I preach this year, my 40th year preaching, the longer you preach, you begin to carry on more cares of a variety of congregations. Because they become your spiritual family in different places. And you want to help and you want to assist. But see, Paul had that along with physical abuse. I've never had one ounce of physical abuse from being a Christian. Paul did. And he still had the cares of the churches. In 1 Timothy 1 and 20, notice it listed twice, point seven and 8. Hymenaeus and Alexandria. They were men that Paul said I had to deliver over to Satan. So they learn not to bless him. And then Demas in 2 Timothy 4.10 
Demons have forsaken me, having loved the present world. You know what is sad? Demons is mentioned three times in Scripture. Twice he was faithful, he was active. The third and final time he was mentioned, he was unfaithful. Demons forsook all who loved the present world. Dear friends, today I will tell you something. Just because you're faithful today does not mean you will be faithful tomorrow. I want you to be. I want you to want to be. But the bottom line is, there have been people who are faithful in times gone by that's not faithful today. So we've got to learn from situations like demons. And we've got to learn to make the right choice at the right time. We've got to protect the flock as elders. We've got to do everything we can to bring forth a very positive environment where people can grow spiritually. They can learn and grow on their own daily basis and their own space and time. They can mature spiritually and they will go to heaven with God, Jesus, and all the righteous ones are. Well, you see, his life very quickly summarized. <coughs> What in the world motivated him to stay the course? What motivated Paul to say, you can bring it to me. I'm going to deal with it. I am here and I'm here to stay. The only way you're going to take me out is kill me. He finally did. Let me tell you what helped him. God's love for Christ motivated him. God's love for Paul motivated him. In Romans 5 verse 8, Paul the apostle let me be made known in no uncertain Turn. He said, God committed his love toward us. And while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And he, he was motivated because of the love that God had for him. Dear friends, you need to be motivated to do the right thing because God loves you like he loved Paul. He wanted him saved. In Romans 8, verse 37 to 39, would you please take your Bible? And turn with me to Romans 8. This is one of the classic passages of all times. It's the last three verses of Romans 8. Romans 8 is a great chapter. I'm going to read the last three verses. I want you to look here at how beautiful this passage is. Paul writing, Romans 7, began at 37. I'm reading from the King James Version. Nay, and all these things were more than conquerors through him that loved us. That's his love that motivated him. He said in verse 38, For I am now persuaded neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, no height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Can it get any better than that? He was such a great man. And God's love motivated him. And God's love motivated you and me to do the right thing as he did him. Number two, Paul was great, grateful and had a great amount of gratitude. In 1 Timothy 1 verse 12 and also verse 15. 1 Timothy 1 verse 12 and 15. You know what Paul said? He said something that I don't know if anybody else has ever said. I thank God for putting me into the have you ever heard anybody say that? I'm thankful to God for making a preacher out of me. I've been preaching 40 years and I don't think I've ever said that. I enjoy my work. I work. The work of an evangelist is a work. But I don't know that I've said I'm thankful that God made me a preacher. He did. He was so grateful. He knew where he was in the introduction of our lesson. He knew where he is now, and he was grateful to have made that transition. He was grateful that God let him live long enough to make that transition. And I pray, God, today, if you're in this assembly and you are not ready to meet your Maker, you have not been baptized for the remission of your sin, you have not been born again, you have not been added to the Lord's church, I pray the Lord to let you live long enough Delay has come in long enough that gives you the opportunity. Guess what? You've got the opportunity here and now. Here and now. <clears throat> Putting it off is making a bad decision. God never promised you another moment. He said today is the day of salvation. 
Never one time you see he said, you should have read the gospel tomorrow, this afternoon, tonight, next year. No, no. Today is the day. If you choose not to obey the gospel and baptism, you choke and go to hell instead of going to heaven if you die. If you're an hour assembly today and you are a baptized believer, and you've not been showing the gratitude of living a Christian life, you need today to step up to the plate. Repent of your sins. Acts 8, 22. Confess your faults. James 5, 1 John 1, 9. Also, have prayer. That's what you have to do. That's not the end of my sermons. I don't get to solve that. But understand this today. We've got to show gratefulness and gratitude to God. Number three, Paul said the responsibility. Oh, this is dynamic. Paul felt a sense of responsibility to go back in and tell people. He said, I'm a debtor to both to the Jew and the Gentile. I am a debtor. I owe people something. I've done a lot of damage before, and I've got a lot of cleaning up to do. And he wanted to get after it. He wanted to get some good things done. A passage I did not write on the board, but I did write Romans 1, 14 through 16. I did write Acts 20 and 24. We show his sense of responsibility. <clears throat> But would you let me use another verse that didn't write down? Romans 9, verse 1 through 3. Paul the Apostle said it this way. He said, Brethren, my heart, my prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. I bear them record. They have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. They are ignorant of God's righteousness. They've gone about to establish their own righteousness. They've not submitted themselves to the righteousness of God. He was concerned for them. He said, I pray God for them. He had a sense of responsibility to speak upon their behalf, to do what he could to aid and to assist. You've got people that you know, your friends, your family, your neighbors, that you have a responsibility to them to at least show them the right way. Okay, number four, Paul must give an account. He knew well and good. I can't live my life and just be haphazard about it. No, he knew I must give an account of my life. Would you go with me to Romans 14 and verse 10? Romans 14 basically deals with Christian liberties. And sometimes when you deal with liberty, you know, one guy says, I'm going to judge you on this matter. Oh, you say, I've never heard anybody say that. You know what they say about their actions. Actions speak louder than words. In Romans 14 and verse 10, Paul said, Why dost thou judge thy brother? Why dost thou set it not thy brother? For we should all stand for the judgment seat of Christ. In matters of Christian liberties, keep your opinions to yourself, according to verse 22 of Romans 14. He said, We're going to stand for the judgment seat of Christ. We're going to answer for all things. 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 10 said we must all appear before the judgment seat. Listen, I'll tell you what. Whether you like it or whether you don't, whether you're saved or whether you're lost, we will all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. I don't know when that's going to be. Literally, it could be before I finish this sentence. It could be before we finish this service. It may be after we're all dead and gone. The Lord may delay his coming for many, many, many years. We don't know. But we do know this. There is going to be a time and a place that we're going to do it. And we're going to face him, and we're going to give an account of our life. Therefore, Christian, what do we learn? We learn to take courage and make the right decision at that time. Point number five, divine help was near. I love this passage in Hebrews. Hebrews is the dynamic book. He showed the superiority of the Lord Jesus Christ. Hebrews 13, verse 5. The great writer said, Speaking of God, I will never leave you, nor will I ever forsake you. Isn't that comforting? Divine help is here. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. Christian people, we have that privilege. Somebody can take away your home, your car, your clothes, your this and your that. But guess what they can never take away? 
They can never take your true relationship with the Lord away from you. You can pray whatever your circumstance. Paul prayed in the popular places. They prayed to the unpopular ones like prison. You can do it. And we can do it. And we need to do it together more and more. Okay. Point number six. All oh, this motivated Paul. He's got the hope of the final reward. He's got the hope of going to heaven. He has every ambition of going to heaven. In 1 Corinthians 9 and 25, you know what Paul talks about? He says some people are working for a corruptible crown. A crown that can be here today, gone tomorrow. But I'm going to tell you about an incorruptible crown, a crown that's not going to fade away. That's what we want. In Galatians 6 and 9, Paul said, let us not become weary in well-doing. Don't become weary. Don't become tired out. Do not become lethargic in living your Christian life. Stay on the battlefront. Get on the front battle. Defend what you believe. Defend the worship. Defend your doctrine. Defend your faith. Defend the right thing. Do the right thing. <coughs> the final day of reward is on its way. You know, in Ephesians 4, I didn't write this on the board, so I add this to your notes. Verse 4 through verse 6, he lists seven ones. One of those seven ones was one hope. You know what that one hope is? The hope of the eternal reward, heaven. We want to go to heaven. So listen, you need to start right now, today, this moment, determine, I want to go to heaven and I'm going to start making the right choices. I'm going to have the courage to do it. I've got brothers and sisters here that are willing to help me do this. I'm going to do it, and I'm going to go to heaven. I remember a number of years ago, I've had the good fortune of baptizing my one and only couple. I'm um, just mentioning the religious organization they were associated with, Jehovah's Witness. I've never baptized but one couple, man and his wife. Tremendous study, and I won't go into all that right now. But I do remember, because they were taught they can't go to heaven because heaven filled the capacity. The 144,000 filled up heaven. And they can't go to hell because hell doesn't exist. All that false doctrine stuff they were taught. But then all of a sudden he realized he could go. He said, I could go to heaven. My Grove, Missouri, I remember it well. He got up. He ran into the kitchen and said, honey, she was making lemonade for us. And he said, we can go to heaven. We can go. And they were so excited to learn, I can go to heaven. He wanted to go, but he didn't think he could because of his former teachings. Dear friend, I want us to want to go to heaven bad enough to say, I'm going to start living right, doing right. I'm going to live that Christian life. I'm going to have the courage to do it. Free to have the courage. 2 Timothy 4, verse 6 through 8. We'll conclude our lesson. This is Paul's farewell speech. If you hear sermons about Paul's farewell speech, you very likely will hear 2 Timothy 4 brought up. This is a very, very important point. It is very important because Paul is going to illustrate the end of his life. Begin at verse 1. He said, I charge thee, therefore before God the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead and is appearing in his kingdom. He said, Timothy, I want you to preach the word. I want you to be instant in season and out of season. I want you to reprove. I want you to rebuke. I want you to exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. That's what he wanted Timothy to do. He said, Timothy, I want you to do the work of an evangelist. I want you to make full proof of your ministry. He wanted him to get ready for that final reward. He said, I have fought a good fight, verse 6. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me in that day, and not to me only, but to all them that love his appearing. He doesn't have a monopoly on going to heaven. Everybody here can go. There will be no vacancy signs in heaven. You can go. If you do keep and obey the will of God, you receive the grace of God not in vain. 
You will respond favorably to God's wonderful, beautiful grace by obeying His will. Put your faith into action. Faith, the faith that saves is the faith that obeys. <coughs> There's so much to be learned today. Paul wanted to go to heaven. Do you want to go to heaven? Are you going to heaven? If you die this moment, are you going to go to heaven? It's your choice. If you've never been baptized today, with the baptism of the Great Commission, you've heard the word. Believe the word. Repent of your sins. Confess the beautiful name of Jesus Christ. I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Be buried in baptism for the remission of your sins. Immersed in water to wash away your sins. This is God's plan. I didn't make it up. It's all in the Bible. If you've taken those steps in your spiritual life, you've taken a spiral and fall. Repent, confess, we'll pray with you for you. If you've got a spiritual need of any kind we can help you with, would you please come, Father Stan? Hear the sweet voice of Jesus saying, Come unto me.